Welcome to 400 Years. In this episode, we're going to dive into the riveting saga of John Brown and Frederick Douglass, two iconic figures of the 19th century abolitionist movement. Witness their converging and diverging paths, complex relationship, and the turbulent events surrounding the Harper's Ferry Raid. As we delve deep, we will explore the strained alliance of these two historic giants in their fight against the brutal institution of slavery and understand the true cost of their convictions. And we will uncover the profound impacts their actions had on America's trajectory towards civil war. In the process, we reveal the transformative power of determination and sacrifice. Join us on this enlightening journey as we explore the rich tapestry of black history and celebrate the resilience, strength, and triumphs of our ancestors. John Brown and Frederick Douglass were two of the most prominent abolitionists of the 19th century. Brown was known for his militant tactics in the fight against slavery, while Douglass, the former slave, became a powerful orator and writer who advocated for the end of slavery. Although they shared the same goal, their approaches were wildly different, and their relationship was often strained. In fact, John Brown's actions almost got Frederick Douglass killed. Frederick Douglass first encountered John Brown in 1847, and the two men had a complex relationship from the very beginning. Brown was passionate, almost maniacally so, about the utter inhumanity of slavery, and he was willing to sacrifice everything to bring about its end. Brown was not an easy person to love, but with a mixture of admiration and ambivalence, Douglass recognized Brown's visionary nature. The relationship between John Brown and Frederick Douglass was marked by Brown's militant and violent stance against slavery, which greatly influenced Douglass's own radicalism in the 1850s. But Douglass remained wary of Brown because, though not lacking in passion and vision, Douglass felt Brown had a secretive nature and strategic ineptness that didn't bode well for success, especially when Brown implored Douglass to join the Harper's Ferry Raid. The two men first met in 1847 at Brown's home in Springfield, Massachusetts. While Douglas was already famous for his background as an enslaved person and his escape from captivity, it was Brown, a white man with a string of failed businesses and unwavering religious fervor, who appeared determined to put an end to the cruel institution of slavery. Douglas, in his 1881 autobiography Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, recalled being impressed by Brown's physical stature, his lean, strong, and sinewy build, and noticed how Brown's children held him in reverence. But it was Brown's impassioned words that left the strongest impression on Douglas, as Brown detailed a plan to liberate the enslaved and guide them to freedom through the Appalachian Mountains. In his recounting of their meetings, Douglas was impressed that Brown demonstrated that he had carefully considered his plans and provided measured responses to Douglas's inquiries. Brown explained that armed men would be stationed at strategic checkpoints, ready to descend into towns to rally the enslaved and secure provisions. Even if they were cornered by authorities, Brown believed that dying for such a noble cause would be a fitting end. Douglas, initially a supporter of William Lloyd Garrison's non-resistance abolitionism, underwent a transformation in his beliefs after spending a night at Brown's home. The encounter left him increasingly skeptical of the peaceful abolition of slavery, and his speeches and writings began to reflect Brown's strong convictions. In his autobiography, Douglas wrote, While I continued to write and speak against slavery, I became all the same less hopeful of its peaceful abolition. My utterances became more and more tinged by the color of this man's strong impressions. Meanwhile, Brown's involvement in the violent, bleeding Kansas conflicts elevated his national profile, earning admiration from those who believed that only bloodshed could end slavery. Douglas, who encountered Brown frequently during this tumultuous period, grew to hold a more favorable impression of Brown and developed a deeper respect for Brown's character. Douglas wrote, I met him often during this struggle and all I saw of him gave me a more favorable impression of the man and inspired me with a higher respect for his character. Brown frequently stayed with Douglas during his trips back east to acquire money and arms during the late 1850s. In late January 1858, Brown visited Douglas's home in Rochester, New York, where he stayed for a month. 
During this secluded period, Brown worked on drafting his Provisional Constitution for Virginia, intending to overthrow the state through his raid on Harper's Ferry's federal arsenal in Virginia. But something was nagging at Douglas. Despite his growing militancy, Douglas still believed in the significance of political action to bring an end to slavery, which put him at odds with Brown's increasing radicalism. Douglas found some of Brown's decisions and ideas questionable, and sometimes downright crazy. He did not get along with Hugh Forbes, an Englishman hired by Brown as his military strategist, during Forbes's visits to Rochester from 1857 through 1858. Douglas found Forbes to be unreliable, both with finances and personal trust. On May 8, 1858, Brown visited Chatham, Ontario, a refuge for escaped slaves from the United States through the Underground Railroad. There, 12 white men and 34 black men endorsed a constitution for the Republic Brown intended to create following his slave uprising. Although Douglas was intrigued by the clandestine plotters against slavery, he did not attend Brown's convention. In March 1859, both men, along with other abolitionist leaders, convened at the home of the prominent black Detroit resident, William Webb. But the men were unable to resolve the stalemate arising from their differing views. John Brown and his plans held a captivating allure and a glimmer of hope, but he remained a challenging figure to truly love. Brown and Douglas met for the final time at a quarry near Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, in August 1859. This time, Brown presented the full scope of his plan to capture the Federal Armory at the Harper's Ferry, Virginia, arsenal and to arm the enslaved for a major insurrection. Sitting on large rocks, Brown and Douglas engaged in a discussion about Brown's plans. Brown earnestly implored Douglas to join his small group of dedicated warriors, expressing a specific purpose for his involvement. Douglas recalled Brown's words, I want you for a special purpose. When I strike, the bees will begin to swarm, and I want you to help hive them. Douglas was disheartened by the shift in Brown's intentions. He had initially understood that Brown aimed to free slaves in Virginia and guide them to safety in the Appalachian Mountains. Yet now, Brown seemed fixated on attacking the federal arsenal, a move Douglas deemed desperate and mistaken. Despite Douglas's warning about the perilous nature of the plan, Brown brushed off the concerns and continued to press for Douglas's participation. While Douglas ultimately declined Brown's pleas, he allowed his companion, Shields Green, to make his own decision. Douglas recounted that Green responded, I believe I'll go with the old man, he said, willingly accepting his fate of dying at Harper's Ferry. After declining to join the ill-fated Harper's Ferry raid on October 16th, 1859, Douglas anxiously awaited news of the attack. The nation was electrified by reports of the assault on the federal arsenal at the confluence of the Potomac and Shenandoah rivers. As Douglas had warned, the raid ended in disaster, with most of the participants either captured or killed. Following Brown's arrest, a letter from Douglas to the old warrior, written in 1857, was among the documents seized. This led outraged Virginians to accuse Douglas of being a co-conspirator in Brown's actions. Douglas, who was lecturing in Philadelphia at the time news of the raid reached him, hastily returned home to Rochester, fearing that if caught and sent to Virginia, he would be killed for being Frederick Douglas. While it is likely that Brown shared more details of his revolutionary plans with Douglas than the orator admitted publicly, Douglas never found Brown's plans or leadership convincing. There is some dispute about the accuracy of Douglas's version of events. John E. Cook, one of Brown's captured men, claimed that Douglas had reneged on a promise to bring additional men to the raid. Brown, refusing to implicate his associates before his death sentence, reportedly expressed frustration to a friend, attributing the missed opportunity at Harper's Ferry to the famous Mr. Frederick Douglas. Accused of being tied to a man facing treason charges, Frederick Douglass defended himself in an October 31st letter to the Rochester Democrat and American. He vehemently denied making any promises to join the raid and clarified that he never encouraged or supported the takeover of Harper's Ferry. But aware of the trouble he faced due to his public association with the accused, Douglass left for England in November. Under a cloud of suspicion, Douglass felt he had no choice but to flee his country. In the rebuttal to Cook's denunciation, 
he declared that the taking of Harper's Ferry was a measure never encouraged by my word or by my vote. My field of labor for the abolition of slavery has not extended to an attack on the United States arsenal. Despite his rhetoric, within the heated climate, Douglas felt, he had no real chance of convincing white America of his innocence. This is why, under cover of darkness on October 22nd, with an arrest warrant issued and federal marshals closing in on his upstate New York hometown, Douglas embarked on a ferry across Lake Ontario, a route he had once guided many escaped slaves through. Faced with anxiety and limited options, Douglas embarked on a lecture trip to England, a journey he had previously planned but now undertook in unexpected circumstances. John Brown and his remaining accomplices were executed on December 2, 1859, for treason, murder, and inciting slave insurrection. There is no doubt that Frederick Douglass, while advocating for his legal innocence, embraced violence and positioned himself as a moral ally of John Brown. This perspective became common among abolitionists, including some Republican politicians. Douglas expressed his readiness to take action against slavery through various means, such as writing, speaking, publishing, organizing, and even conspiring, as long as there was a reasonable hope of success. Douglas believed that those who deprived others of their labor and freedom had forsaken justice and honor, becoming akin to thieves and pirates. Importantly, Douglas clarified that his objection was not to Brown's ultimate goals or justifications, but rather to his specific methods and tactics. He highlighted that Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, demonstrated the necessity of lawlessness as a weapon for abolitionists. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 had turned virtually all radical abolitionists into lawbreakers. Douglas was willing to defy the law and even kill those he deemed as pirates. But he recognized that effectively combating slavery and its pervasive influence required more than courage and justification. It demanded exceptional cunning, skill, mobilization, and military prowess. Returning to America from England in 1860 after the loss of his beloved daughter Annie, Douglas found his family in mourning and the nation on the verge of disunion. Within his arsenal of rhetorical weapons against slavery and soon the Confederacy, John Brown's death remained a powerful symbol. Despite Brown's challenging nature during his lifetime, his significance in death was undeniable. The Brown family, however, harbored bitterness towards Douglas, feeling betrayed by his actions. In a country on the brink of civil war the following summer, Douglas recognized the value of invoking Brown as a martyr for the anti-slavery cause and as a means to recruit Union soldiers. Having accomplished his mission with the Union's victory, Douglas later celebrated his fallen friend through speeches delivered on multiple occasions, including one at Storer College in Harper's Ferry in 1881. Douglas held a profound appreciation for Brown's enduring value to the cause of black freedom, consistently eulogizing him as a martyr and a classical hero. In the Storer College speech, he depicted the armory raid as a resounding thunderclap that ignited a morally deteriorating nation into action. Douglas emphatically proclaimed that Brown's defeat marked his true triumph, and his capture became the victory of his life. Reflecting on his own ambivalence towards Brown's plans in 1859, Douglas acknowledged the remarkable power of his symbol following the execution, encapsulating the significance of the aged warrior. Douglas recognized Brown's unwavering commitment to his cause, emphasizing the transformative nature of his sacrifice. Brown's execution on the gallows took on a sacred significance comparable to the Christian cross, symbolizing his profound devotion and unyielding resolve. In the wake of Brown's martyrdom, Douglas continued to honor his memory and the impact he had on the fight for black freedom. Of John Brown, he said, with the Appalachian Mountains for his pulpit, the country for his church, and the whole civilized world for his audience, he was a thousand times more effective as a preacher than as a warrior. Despite his lack of skill in executing revolutionary violence, Brown managed to incite a broader revolution in America through his actions. In the conclusion of the Storer College speech, Douglas declared, When John Brown stretched forth his arms, the sky was cleared. The time for compromise was gone, and to the armed hosts of freedom, standing above the chasm of a broken union, was committed the decision of the sword, and thus made her own 
and not John Brown's, the lost cause. As a result, Douglas held Brown in eternal reverence as the hero of the abolitionist movement. During his speeches recruiting black soldiers in 1863, Douglas would often burst into song, leading the crowd in John Brown's body, invoking Brown's spirit and inspiring young men to join the fight against slavery. Brown had evolved into more than just an adored figure. He embodied the very essence that kept the cause for freedom alive and propelled it forward during challenging times. The impact of the events at Harper's Ferry had a transformative effect on the nation. It unleashed a tide of anger that traumatized white Americans from all backgrounds. Southerners were gripped by fear of large-scale slave rebellions, while Northerners, who had hoped to postpone violent confrontations over slavery, were radicalized by the incident. Many abolitionists and black Americans considered Brown and his raiders heroes, the raid struck a sharp and emotional chord in the black American community. Francis Ellen Watkins, a prominent black abolitionist of the day, wrote to John Brown while he awaited his fate in a Virginia prison cell. We may earnestly hope that your fate will not be a vain lesson, that it will intensify our hatred of slavery and love of freedom, and that your martyred grave will be a sacred altar upon which men will record their vows of undying hatred to that system which tramples on man and bids defiance to God. Prior to Harper's Ferry, political leaders believed that the growing divide between the North and South could eventually be resolved through compromise. But, after the events at Harper's Ferry, the divide seemed insurmountable. It fractured the Democratic Party, disrupted the Republican leadership, and created the conditions that propelled Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln to victory in the 1860 presidential election. If John Brown's raid had not taken place, the 1860 election would likely have been a standard two-party contest between anti-slavery Republicans and pro-slavery Democrats. The Democrats would probably have emerged victorious, given that Lincoln received only 40% of the popular vote, around one million votes fewer than his three opponents. The Democratic Party faced internal divisions over the issue of slavery, while Republican candidates like William Seward were tainted by their association with abolitionists. In contrast, Lincoln, seen as one of the more conservative options within his party at the time, benefited from the fragmentation of his opponents. By disrupting the established party system, Brown inadvertently facilitated Lincoln's victory, which, in turn, led to the secession of 11 states and, ultimately, the Civil War. While Brown was initially dismissed by white historians as an irrational fanatic or worse, a more nuanced view has emerged with the civil rights movement and a deeper understanding of the nation's racial challenges. Brown, though seen as hard and unconventional, possessed a profound empathy for the plight of the enslaved. He defied the pervasive racism of his time and formed close friendships with black Americans, often feeling more at ease in their company than with fellow whites. This has been 400 Years. Thank you for joining us on this journey of exploration into the heroic struggle for freedom and justice. We want to express our gratitude to each and every one of you for watching our videos. We hope it provided you with valuable insights along the way. If you enjoyed learning about John Brown and Frederick Douglass, please give this video a thumbs up and share it with others who might find it interesting. Remember to subscribe to 400 Years for more exciting topics in the future. Thank you once again for your support, and we'll see you in the next video.